Well, it's such a pleasure to see you all here. Um, my name is Jennifer Anderson. I teach um, at LCSC. I teach composition, creative nonfiction, and am also the advisor of um, Talking River Review, our student-run college, our literary journal on campus. This is LCSC's 41st annual Stegner Lecture. This lecture, established in 1982, with Wallace Stegner as the inaugural speaker has long been a literary and cultural highlight for the college and the larger Lewiston Clarkston community. Featuring discussions about the writer's relationship with the physical and psychological territories in which they reside. Past speakers have included Edward Abbey, Norman McLean, Linda Hogan, Terry Tempest Williams, Robert Wrigley, Mary Clearman Blue, Kim Barnes, and Natalie Diaz, among so many others. Tonight, we are honored to feature Idaho's current writer-in-residence, Seamarie Furman. I'd like to thank my colleagues in the Humanities Division for their generous help with and support of this event, specifically Louis Sylvester, Marlo Daly Galeano, Leilani Farrell, our Division Chair, Kyle Ferguson, and Liberal Arts and Sciences Dean, Martin Gibbs. I'd also like to thank Emily Johnson here at the Center for Arts and History for lending us this beautiful space for tonight's event, as well as President Pemberton for her support. And thanks to Kevin Grote in Communications and Marketing for recording this lecture, which will be posted to the Humanities Division YouTube channel at a later date. This event was also made possible by the generous support of the Rose Hill Estate and the Idaho Commission on the Arts. I'm now going to turn it over to Hector Rivera, a secondary education English major at LC State. He will introduce tonight's lecture, and following the lecture, there will be time for questions. Also, after the lecture, two of our Talking River Review student interns will be selling copies of our most recent issue, number 53. Um, Talking River Review has been going since 1994, um, which opens with a beautiful essay by C. Marie Furman titled, I Know Jack. This is being offered at a special Stegner lecture rate. <laughs> Buy a copy of the issue and get a free year-long subscription to the issue. So you get three issues for the price of one for $10. And finally, just as a reminder, make sure your cell phones are off. Now, here's Hector. We're good? Okay. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 41st Annual Stegner Lecture. I'm honored to be here today to introduce our guest speaker, Seamarie Furman, one of the most insightful writers of our time. Seamarie Furman is an, is an accomplished writer who has earned a reputation for her powerful and thought-provoking works. Her writing covers a range of themes and styles, from the complexities of human relationships to the natural beauty of the wilderness. Her work has been recognized and praised by both critics and readers alike, and she has received numerous awards and accolades for her contributions to the literary world. Seamarie Furman is the author of Camp Beneath the Dam Poems and co-editor of the Cascadia Field Guide, Art, Ecology, and Poetry, as well, of as, well as Native Voices, Indigenous Poetry, Craft, and Conversations. She has published or forthcoming poetry and nonfiction in multiple journals and anthologies. Seamarie is a regular columnist for The Inlander, translations editor for the Board Sided Press, and director of the Elk River Writers Workshop. She is associate director and director of poetry at Western Colorado University, where she teaches nature writing. Seamarie is the host of Terra Firma, a podcast from Colorado Public Radio. She resides in the Salmon River Mountains of Idaho, serving as the Idaho writer in residence. Born and raised in the heart of the West, C. Marie Furman has always been inspired by the allure of the wild. Her writing reflects the lo th this love for the land, and she uses her words to shed light on the deep connection she has with the natural world. As she writes in her essay, Lake Eight, here is the most beautiful place in the wilderness, in Idaho, in the West. My world in the moment we passed it, 
it was only us and the lake. Memory and knowledge of other places I loved fell from me as blossoms fall from the fireweed. I lost all agency and felt if I sat long enough, roots may grow from, my, from the back of my legs and I might find myself as natural to the landscape as the white bark pine, the milk colored goat. Through her writing, she invites readers to explore the wonders of nature and to question our relationship with the earth. Sea Marie Furman's work is not just about the beauty of nature, however. She is also a powerful voice for environmental activism, using her writing to bring attention to the challenges facing our planet and the importance of protecting the environment. She challenges us to think critically about our decisions and their impact on the world around us, and she inspires us to take action to make a positive difference. In addition to her environmental activism, Seamary Furman is also a gifted storyteller. Her works are filled with characters who are complex and multifaceted, and she uses their stories to explore themes of love, loss, and identity. Her writing is both personal and universal, touching on experiences and emotions that are relatable to all of us. She has a unique voice and a strong message, and I'm certain that her words will stay with us long after the lecture has ended. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Idaho's writer in residence, C. Marie Furman. Wow. I don't know how I'm supposed to go on now that um, he's taken my breath away. Um, I guess this better be good. <laughs> oh my goodness. Hector, thank you. Really, that was amazing. And thank all of you. Um, there's a lot of things you could be doing tonight and that you're sitting here with me like this is incredible. And I never probably would have guessed this for my life and I'm deeply honored that you would spend your time with me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and thank you to everyone at LCSC. What an amazing college you have here and group of people and community. It's really, really fantastic. And it's been such an honor to be a guest here and have wonderful conversations. Last night, um, the students read me stories in class and it was one of the best like bedtime readings ever. I went to bed with all of these beautiful images and stories and it was truly one of the greatest gifts of my life. And what an honor to be here and to follow in the footsteps of my mentor, Kim Barnes and um, and Wallace Segner, that's a huge honor. And the people who have come before me have all made it possible for me to be here today. And I'm truly grateful, grateful for that. And uh, wow, it's just that I have the little bit, is anyone else nervous? It's just, <laughs> just me probably, okay, okay. Hey, um, before I get started, I do want to dedicate this story to the two people who really made it possible for me to be here tonight. Kim is one of them, and my partner Caleb is the other, who, is, who has, been, um, has been fundamental in my writing and, and, and has taught me Idaho and helped me fall in love with the place. So he's as much a part of any of my writing as I am. This is the story of a river, a road, and a fish. The river is the South Fork of the Salmon. More specifically, it is the stretch of the South Fork of the Salmon River that begins in a meadow named Stoli until it joins the Seasash River beneath my favorite bridge, a bridge that curves in a way to suggest it is hugging the river, that curves like a comma, asking drivers to pause as they cross, to pause and look into the water below, look in as if there are answers there to our most important questions. Look in because there are answers there. But this bridge is not on the road that it, this story is interested in, but the road and the bridge and the fish that swim in the river are all on the way to the trail where the story begins. The trail, like the river, like the fish, predate white settlement, yet it was worn by human feet. It is kept up now 
by hooves and paws, and on a day in late May of 2022, it knows the tread of my own souls, following the tread of my partner, the paws of my two dogs, and the notion of wonder. On this day, the hill we climb is golden with arrow leaf balsam root. I have known many flowers, but the balsam root, to my knowing, is most companionable. Iris of gold, pupil of earth. I am never alone when I am walking among them, each greeting me from beside the trail, each eye watching my step, giving me glimpses in the soil that is the soul of all beings. Looking now into those brown eyes, I see ancestors, human and greater than. Every being whose bone and ash fed the balsam roots bloom, fed the others that grow here too, fed the deer whose body fed my own. Once before I stopped picking flowers, I tucked a stem behind my ear and for a moment gained another sight. In that moment, seeing through the soil color and gilded eye, I saw what I think I can call immutability. For a moment, I knew what was meant by the words, look to the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, nor do they spin. And for a moment, I toiled not, nor spun as well. But this morning, the one of our story, the one after I stopped picking flowers, choosing instead to hold them with my own eyes, sometimes a lens, let them grow and flourish to be breakfast for deer or vole, or just remain in poetry as the place where sunrises are born. This morning, I merely greeted them as I toiled up the steep trail, the very old trail, with my dogs, my man, and the song of robins above me, and the river and salmon below. To know the landscape of the South Fork of the Salmon River, hold your hands at heart level, palms down, and spread the fingers of one hand, then the other, and weave them together, stopping at your first knuckle. Here is where the river winds through, still cutting the canyon that holds it, and there, between your fingers, are the drainages. We can name a few now, but know that names are mutable, and they have had many and may have many to come, but today we will call them Buckhorn, and Camp, and Phoebe, and Nasty. And if you can imagine the landscape of your hands as big as mountains, like the Salmon River Mountains that hold the South Fork of the Salmon River, you will see how steep your fingers have become, what a travail it might be to get to the back of your hand, but what a gift the summit will be when you get there. The view notwithstanding, the back of your hand becomes a place to hope for, an easy walk, a rest, this is where we are headed, the back of your hand. That is the summit, that is the summit and the ridge, though for the sake of our story and the stories yet to come, let's not name the drainage we walk, nor the creek that flows through it. Forgive my lie of omission, but trails like the one we are taking to the back of your hand are best left unnamed, just as some wishes are le best left unspoken if you want them to come true. The morning air is cool. It will rain. This, my partner, the fish biologist, tells me is salmon weather. And yes, there are salmon in the South Fork of the Salmon River, or soon there will be. And they are part of the story of river and road. But for the sake of the story, let's say that they are more than salmon. Let's say they are a symbol for all life in the river, from steelhead to sculpin, mussel to lamprey. And the weather matters greatly to this story, particularly that it is salmon weather, because salmon weather means rain. And rain means that from the top and the sides of the hills that we see in your hands, water will flow down, down, down into the streams and the sea sesh, and down into the South Fork of the Salmon River that flows down to the main Salmon River itself and is passing now, not far from here, 
in a river called the Clearwater, which joins the Columbia and then the Pacific, and somewhere in that salinate water, right now, spring Chinook are turning their bodies east, turning their bodies back to fresh water, and carrying within those bodies food for the balsam root and black bear, and even the ponderosa, carrying life in its myriad forms in eggs or milt, carrying life back to the South Fork of the Salmon River. The salmon are carrying this life in their own story as they make their way upstream, a travail not like the short and simple walk up the drainage of our hands, but one that must overcome dams, resist current, jump falls, to come to the headwaters where our story and the river began. Spring rain, spring snow, runoff, water. The banks of the creeks fill, even only if slightly. They rise the sea sesh and the south fork of the salmon and the main and so on down the line. And in times before the dams, before man opened gates, was gatekeeper to passage, the rising water made it easier for the salmon to maneuver around boulders, over falls, and make their way up the thin streams and the wrist-like tributaries to that place where even now lie the eggs that will soon hatch and the bodies that will grow and grow and eventually this salmon weather will be the spring water they ride down, passing us, passing their ancestors, passing the story on to a new generation. There is something else about the rain when it falls, as soon it will, on the ridge and the drainage and the trail which we walked on that early May morning. It will loosen the soil. Snow knows this too. And the soil and rain will let go some small bits of earth which will roll down the hillside, past the arrow leaf and lodgepole, to an old dirt road. This is where our story may have stopped. Because in this landscape and in this story, the road begins to complicate things. Like dams, it begins to disrupt the natural order, the downward movement. It disrupts relationship between slope and rain and river and fish. It is as if mid-stride, mid-step, me and the dogs and the fish biologist named Caleb freeze as a photograph stills a moment, but it is more complicated than that, and yet it is also like pausing life, because those hillsides, like the salmon turning east in the Pacific, like me giving you this story, are meant to give something to the river. This is what it means to be a good ancestor, to keep the gift moving, and the hill gives pebbles and duff, and also boulders and entire trees. And though this seems catastrophic, sometimes a little catastrophe is necessary. Sometimes it takes an avalanche to feed a river the logs and boulders it needs to create homes and hiding for bull trout, beds for mussels, and to clean beaches and push debris downstream. This is their agreement. But the agreement was broken, or at least altered, by the road where the rain has stopped. And with it came a new partner in the relationship, for the road was cut by a big yellow machine, not souls this time, not merely a path, but six feet of leveled earth, and instead of tread of soul came tread of tire. The road played a part in a different kind of home. It was part of a web of roads cut into the fingers of hillside, zigzagging back and forth, swaying as if dancing and taking each tree it came to as a partner, shaking the dress of limbs and boughs until the final dip from a feller or a saw from which the coniferous dancer never recovered. It was a dance of industry, the 1960s, the pride of lumberjacks who I know for I've met some, loved the South Fork of the Salmon River, loved these hills and the arrow leaf and pine as much as I do, as much as the Nimipu and the Tukadika, whose cambium peels are scars too. Love, we can agree, 
is as hard to define as Idaho itself. And perhaps both are best that way, perhaps, but then the immutability I mentioned before, things did change. Perhaps our love, or the way we show it. Perhaps we found that we can love or at least need a thing too much. And so hundreds and hundreds of miles of roads were gashed into hillsides, millions of trees were cut into board feet, and the slopes of the South Fork were as bare as the back of your hands, except for the roads. And when the big machines finally rolled away, when all the old trees were gone and the lumberjacks moved on and the stumps that thrust from the earth were fists or tombstones or merely stumps exposing their years in a circle of circles containing old songs, containing ancient storms, circles like whorls in the print of your finger, maybe we don't know as unique too. And though I was born after the roads, I have seen the South Fork of the Salmon without them. The first time in black and white, in a photograph buried in archives and uncovered almost as if by accident, but perhaps providence. For here is a haunting coincidence, the photographer who made the black and white photo, whose landscape I know, made the picture from the same trail where I stood in the tread of my partner, my dogs, the hooves and paws, and the footsteps of ancestors. Not just the same trail, but the same exact place. And the providence I talked about, the accident of finding, was a result of a search for a past I was trying to imagine. A past that included a homesteader cabin that no matter its fortitude when it was built is gone, no foundation or chimney or root cellar remain. I don't recall what I was hoping to find in my search, except that sense of wonder that comes with something so seemingly solid as home, a life built into place, being suddenly absolutely erased, as if it never existed, which does not surprise me given our history and the way entire lives and cultures can be erased. So maybe it's not wonder that this missing achieves but something like hope, which is something R.E. Benedict in 1904 might have felt when he stood where so many others had stood before, others unlike him, and where I would stand 107 years later. There was no road into the South Fork then, no gentle curve of bridge, no signs at stream crossing, no lookouts on peaks. There were no dams on the salmon. Idaho had been a state for only 15 years, and the US Forest Service but was a twinkle in Roosevelt's eye. Ah, but Teddy and Gifford had the wheels turning, and the photograph was taken by a man sent to scout for potential forest reserves. The label on the photo reads bull pine, yellow pine, and is not place but trees food for a growing nation, the photographer and his horses or mules or horses and mules, his gear weighty and cumbersome, took this same trail up and up and set up his equipment first east, then west. I wonder what the trees heard in that moment when the first shutter clicked. Did the horses and mules flinch? Did the deer did the elk or flicker tense with prescience? Did the salmon? Was there a notion in that shudder of what was to come? And not that a landscape as dynamic as the South Forks does not change. But in that moment, did immutability have a sound? Did it usher in a change unlike any ever seen in these mountains before? And so, with a click of a shutter, a new story began for the South Fork of the Salmon River. And in time, a new sound would fill the hills, first buck saws and backhoes and excavators, fellers and semis. What once was just roar of river would be covered by sound of progress. 
Before I knew of the man and his camera, before the archives and the rain, I knew too was coming, the rain that brought us to this pause in the road, I had made pictures of my own, first east, then west. It was an outcropping of rock, a prominence, a place of view, and I stood atop it and paused because sometimes, because any more, I am stilled by beauty. I am brought into a state of awe, sometimes to the point of tears, tears that confuse me as much as they comfort me, for they seem not to know the difference between the beauty of joy and the beauty of pain. Or maybe it's because that we fear to lose beauty, for however we might define it, beauty gives us a sense of hope. And perhaps hopelessness may be defined as the absence of beauty. And maybe my tears are both afraid of what we found and what we might lose, and so sometimes I hoard my emotion into a photograph. I collect the tears into a picture that I then pour out to friends, to myself over and over again, when solace seems so hard to find. And when I need to remind myself that there are places where, despite roads and men, despite conflicts and catastrophe, despite the longing of a river for her fish, the streams for their first names, despite what would come after the flinch of that first shutter, likely the very first shutter to close on these slopes, on the steep fingers that fed water and sediment and boulders and seed into the south fork of the Salmon River. There is a place that I can turn to, even only if in memory, where I stand on the edge of hope. And perhaps it is the immutability of the photograph, that stasis, that beauty gathered, that is evidence, that is necessary to prove there is something to be hopeful about. Is this what is meant by faith? Look to the arrow leaf who do not spin nor toil. There is something else about the photographs, about looking into places where we can imagine. Something Wallace Stegner wrote about in his wilderness letter when he wrote, something will have gone out of us as a people if we ever let the remaining wilderness be destroyed. We simply need that wild country available to us, even if we never do more than drive to its edge and look in. He called it part of the geography of hope, and perhaps Benedict did too, and perhaps the loggers and the miners and the homesteaders that came in and removed the Tukadika, Nimipu, the salmon, the wolves, the grizzly, the ponderosa, and how many others that had a different name or no name, a different story, or no story at all for this place, that saw something that looked like hope. The human-centric kind, the short view, the narrow view, like the photograph that can only hold so much, that can only show a bit of what matters to the entire landscape, to a future. For I believe that wilderness to native people, native fishes, and even some poets, was not so easily labeled, was not so easily boundaried, was not wilderness at all, was simply an extension of life, like home, maybe like the hands you use to make the landscape of the South Fork something to be attached to, not separate from, no nature and not nature, but only nature, only wilderness, nothing but home, and knowing this home existed and allowing it to exist meant human existence, meant life, meant that we too are part of the landscape, our wilderness, and that what we had inflicted, what we were about to inflict, would cause us to lose more than trees and fish, would cause us to lose what we didn't know then was hope. I believe that most of those that would come in the half century after Benedict, the loggers, the CCC workers, the miners and homesteaders did so with good intent. I like to believe that they took pride in their work, were glad to have work, and believe their labors were part of a greater good. 
and those with children believed they would be remembered as good ancestors, making a better future for those children and those children to follow. I like to think that whomever drove the dozer that made the road that I am telling you about tonight told a story of progress and industry and frontierism to children who would look with pride at their fathers and mothers, trusting that yes, it was destiny. Yes, it would regrow. Yes, this land of plenty would always be in. Yes, we were fair and did the best thing for those who had first called this canyon home. I have to believe that story in order to believe this one, the one I'm trying to tell, the one that says we are capable of a great many things, the best of which may be making new stories. Come back with me now to the pause of the rain and earth on the road. Here, the earth and seeds that were tumbling down with water stop. But rainwater, raindrops, is a gift that is always in motion. So when the drop reaches the flat, it cannot shed as watersheds are bent to do, but gathers and pools on compacted earth, gathers and pools until it finds a slope enough to make a rivulet carve runnels, and fall finally down. But in this new path, missing the roots it once fed, maybe feeding a different stream, and maybe the force of its gathering destabilizing and carrying more than earth, more than rocks and trees, more and more and down and down into the river where reds of ancestors have been made for centuries. And those reds are flushed, maybe the eggs are lost, and the salmon return to empty beds if they return at all. And in the years after the clear cuts, after the easiest trees were felled, the trees that shaded the river, kept cool the water for fishes, gave shade and eventually homes, the land began to slide, whole hillsides into water. And I say hillside because though tonight you and I talk about a small stretch of road, a single curve really, like the salmon that represent all fish in the river, this piece of road is representative of over 800 miles of roads cut into the fingers and ridges, cut into the landscape that is an extension of home, cut in miles longer than those traveled by salmon that return from the Pacific to Stoli Meadows, which is long indeed. And if you can imagine that distance and the road switched back and how the land then sloughed and slid, you know that more land went into the river than the river in all its wonder could manage. I understand this in poetry, which can bend to hyperbole, but this is not exaggeration, for I have seen it. And if I could tell you the way my partner has graciously told me, my partner, the fish biologist, Caleb, who has spent most of his career studying habitat, studying homes of salmon, I would give you the science of sediment. I would offer the facts and data, graphs with lines, blue and red, that would show distribution and declining numbers, I would show you, too, that the lines stagger greatly toward declines and steeply as the South Fork Salmon River slopes to loss. There is something also happening, some direct result of our being there, of cooperation, of the idea of healing. In those lines, a shift, however subtle, a river recovery, a rising line of hope. And for some, that might be enough. And for some, that may be the only story they need. But on a day in May on a trail, where the souls of ancestors and treads of a man mostly forgotten to history, the paw prints and hoof prints and the tread of Caleb, then me, I found something data can't measure, that no scientific experiment can track, something my photo would gather, and someday, perhaps be placed next to another that is almost forgettable, <clears throat> something that is almost forgettable, something that should be forgettable, a restoration, a restoration, 
a new way of being good ancestors. Before the photograph and the ancestral trail, I had not known the South Fork of the Salmon River without logging roads. I can recall first glimpses, my finger pointing to Z's on slopes and Caleb's answer, it doesn't go anywhere. It was cut for logging. It goes to where trees were and stops. And I could not understand, not fully, that a road would be built to nowhere. And in those early years, when I still hunted the canyon for deer, the roads were the easy way in. Dense and steep as the country is, the roads, or what was left of them, was easy walking, quiet walking. But if there is anything a canyon abhors, it's a road. And so those that were closed, those forgotten, had begun to reclaim themselves. And walking then, though easier than the straight scramble up, meant climbing over downed trees, meant squeezing through ceanothus, meant sometimes finding what loggers left behind. Of the hundreds of miles I have walked in the South Fork, many of them have been on old roads whose convenience and use made them trails. And I was greedy to walk them, to see, to gain a deeper look into the heart of this wilderness, but I should have known that convenience isn't an offering of the canyon, that a contrivance of man, one made to take, would never give me the views I needed, for unwildness can't lead to wild. When I was first in love with the South Fork, I loved her roads and all. I let the contrivances be my convenience without second thought because I have rationalized that love is acceptance of what is. And I believe that if this could remain immutable, this landscape as I first met it, if no more change would come, no more holes in her sides, no dams on her rivers, if the designations we'd place by the institution we place faith in could protect the South Fork of the Salmon River, the streams and creeks, nasty buckhorn, camp and Phoebe, the trail from being found out as a trail so ancient it aches with history, if we could protect this, keep it from changing, keep the tractors and plows and mining companies away, then maybe that would be love. Maybe that would show a little hope to predecessors. Maybe they would look to us with some pride and say they did try. What I'm trying to say is that I fell in love with the South Fork despite its scarred hillsides because I, embarrassed, I am embarrassed to tell you Though I imagined things could get worse, I never imagined they might get better. This was my story of the South Fork and the roads. And I thought that despite what Caleb's research was finding, for research has been done and ignored before, that this was as good as it gets. And this I accepted. And I put my faith in places downriver in time that dams would be removed, perhaps, that roads that were closed would stay closed and never tempt another clear cut, and that the Ceanothus and Ponderosa might cover our scars, as if Ceanothus and Ponderosa were some kind of thick paint. And in some photo a hundred years from now, no one would see a road, and that not seeing would be enough. Just as I couldn't see what was to come in Benedict's photo, just as you could not see what was happening in mine. Wisdom, Stegner writes, is knowing what you have to accept. What I didn't know, what I couldn't see, was this was not the story of the South Fork we had to accept. What I didn't know was the reason Caleb had brought me to this old trail. What I hadn't yet seen, a new story, that was being written on the land. The story of the South Fork of the Salmon River, as you've seen, could be the modern story of many places in the West, the story after the stories whose language was ignored. Settlers moved in, natives are forced out. Those who instilled fear from grizzlies to sheep eater Indians were killed. 
Manifest destiny was invoked and trees and rivers and deer and land were now named resource, was commodified. And a certain amount of greed settled in and what once seemed bountiful, innumerable by the aforementioned sons and daughters of the loggers and miners was taken by saw, by shovel, by gun, was taken by dredge or drill, by single homesteaders and huge corporations, by government entities created to preserve, and then was either colonized or abandoned. In the areas that Benedict's photos made preserves, plans were written and promises made about caring for the land and serving the people, the which people it served and how to define caring was mutable and only sometimes realized. In the areas that were abandoned because they offered no resource, a pall settled in. Lakes that offered no fish were labeled barren. Rivers reduced to reservoirs were stocked to attract visitors and became thick with algae and stale of story. And this says nothing of the people who call this homeland, those whose ancestors wore the trail in, people as resilient as the landscape and who, like the salmon, are trying, despite all the obstacles, to return home to natal waters through culture and language, both of which are dependent, not apart from, the landscape they are attached to, attached to, as we to the back of our hands. And when looked at this way, when considering the entire West, a new story seems almost impossible. It seems sometimes that the only change can be for the worse. It seems that we are depending on someone downstream or down the years to fix what is wrong here and today. When looked at this way, hope is an impossibility and the fear of not knowing what the first ancestors knew, what Benedict felt when he set up that tripod in 1904, what Stegner meant with his words in 1964, and what I saw on that May morning, looking first east, then west, then back east again, is the fear I have as a future ancestor, is the fear that drove me to write this story, is a fear that if we do not create some amount of hope in both actions and words, the only story we will believe is the one already written on the roads and the landscape. I forgot to mention the Clarkia on the May walk. Do you know Clarkia? Such a deep purple and more than I had ever seen. I forgot too the Ponderosa I wanted to mention. It stood alone on the hillside, 200 feet tall, a sentinel, a reminder. I have not known many larger for most of the old trees. Well, we've learned where they've gone and even this one was arrow straight and prime for the mill. It somehow was spared and housed beetles, held robins and our backs as we leaned against it, eating our lunches, looking west. In its rings are the stories of thunderstorms and winters, the song of Nimipu and the cry of Osprey, the sound of wolves howling, the shudder of Benedict's camera and the sound of the saw and now my sound too. In the heartwood is the DNA of the Pacific, delivered in spent salmon, shot by turkey vultures and eagles. In its bark is a, a nest of woodpeckers, and in its view is a landscape that, over the last century and a half, has been forced to change. And because imagination is part of my trade, I imagine the 1960s and a Sawyer who saw this Ponderosa, its location, its presence like a lighthouse, a beacon, and said, no, not this one. And that tree heard it too. And in that one word, a new seed was planted, an ancestor born, bearing something called hope. The rain, when it came, fell with a fervor, fell as if each drop had a job to do, was being deployed 
with a singular focus. The clouds threw the rain down, and despite our attempt to take shelter beneath denser pine, the rain found us too, and in time, all I had protected with coat and hat was cold and wet. Rain dropped from the whiskers of the dogs, from the brims of our hats and the sides of our packs. Rain like tears on our cheeks, rain chilled down our spines, rain filling each crack and crevice it could reach, rain finding roots and delivering life, rain as salmon weather. The old dog stood in the rain like a challenge. The younger nosed his way beneath our bent legs as if in his canine lineage, rain and dog were never to meet. And me, I thought of the water gathering in the river, gathering on the slope, water shedding off leaves and limbs and rock and water, watering the old pondo. Water at the top of the ridge, carrying seed and some sediment, going down and down to that place where the first rain in our story stopped. But this rain fell down to the road, no longer a road, then down to the river and did not stop. And when the storm passed, as storms are wont to do and do quickly in this part of the Salmon River Mountains, and before the song, the song of robin returned before the din of river rose up the hillside i heard a sound that before would have frightened me before would have been the opposite of hope through the trees and across our unnamed drainage on a hillside in the photo i took what you cannot see i heard the roar of the bulldozer's diesel engine as it caught and fired to life it was the only sound other than the river and birdsong and thunder and suffering of trees that we'd heard all morning. It had been our constant companion on the trail uphill. It wasn't as loud as I imagined it would be, for I thought things of that nature, things of that ability, should and did come with quite a racket. It wasn't both present and distant, almost like the thunder that now rumbled miles away and though it brought no rain, its presence was welcome. When I first saw it that morning, I gasped and I pointed at its orange body, its jaws and shovel, and this time Caleb just smiled and said, come, let me show you. Said a word I was beginning to look forward to hearing, said obliteration. When I first heard it, the word obliteration, I flinched. Obliteration sounded like destruction, and destruction is what I had come to fear for the South Fork of the Salmon River landscape. The word sounded like destruction, and its result looked like destruction. When we reached the place where the old trail, the Indian trail, once met the road, I am overwhelmed by the smell of raw earth. I look west and see what is called obliteration, trees uprooted and earth upside down, soil tilled and mounded, rocks strewn without pattern, scrapes and pulls, and what could be called catastrophe if I didn't know what Caleb then tells me. Soon a woman toting a canvas bag filled with seeds, native seed mix, seeds of yarrow and bunch grass will come walking past. She will scatter this seed while others transplant nine bark and ceanothus into newly uncompacted soil that was only hours or days earlier road. And she will walk east toward river where I can see the giant orange excavator working its way down and down the ridge line, down the old road, the compacted bed it tears up as it moves, pulling together road cut to road fill pulling hillside to hillside together like seams of a wound. On occasion, the excavator will grab a root ball and all of a juvenile pine and place it into a hole it's left in the wreck, then a rock, then another swipe above to pull below, leaving slope where shelf had been. And for a moment, it is like I am watching time unwind history in reverse at six feet an hour. 
and the irony of the Indian Trail meeting the road, the native seed planted in the uncompacted soil, the tribe and the government and Benedict's photo and now mine, Stegner's story of hope meeting mine, the irony of healing a wound or maybe what looks like a metaphor for the beginning of healing between ancestors, new and old is not lost on me. And when the excavator reaches the river, it will be driven to the top of another nowhere going road and it will begin again and again until another 300 miles of roads are obliterated. And then after the woman with her seed and the workers with their shovels leave the first prints in this fresh but not new soil, the land will be left to heal. The sound of heavy equipment that has brought destruction and grace will reside in the rings of the lodgepole, the rain that has fallen, the rain that gave us pause and chill, the rain that fell as if it had a job to do, will soak into the soil that is the soul of all things in the South Fork of the Salmon River, will make its way to seed, to root, and it will feel something like I felt the first time I saw the South Fork, something like I felt when I saw the upturned earth, something like I hadn't imagined was possible, something like love, but more like hope. And what gives me the most hope in this story has less to do with this unroading, will do, has less to do than this unroading will do for the fish and the river, though that is important too. This hope I felt welling like pain, beauty, tears, was the hope for humans who visit this land. Because in the plan that created this change, the forest plan, the plan of land managers, was a plan future thinking, a story written by those who will be seen as good ancestors, even as they will never live to see the effects of their work. For though it will take a half century or more for the wound to heal, it will. And there is a chance that another woman, a century after my passing, in love as I am with the South Fork of the Salmon River, will, of a May morning, walk up what she guesses is a game trail. She will follow the tracks of wolves and bear, the heart-shaped hoof prints of deer and the musk of elk. She will look into the eyes of the arrow leaf not knowing all the ancestors looking back at her. She will, I hope, feel the ghosts of others that ask her to stop and look first west, then east. She will stop near the base of a lodgepole that may by then be only a snag, a ghost itself, still stalwart and knowing. And she will lean against it and stare upon that landscape that she would never imagine a road upon. She will step to the edge of the ridge and look in and see what some have called resource, some have called preserve, some have called wilderness, and some have no name for it all except home. And maybe compelled by beauty and not the fear of losing it, she will step to that age, that edge, arms open, head bowed, and the sound that the trees and the birds and the river will hear is the sound of her voice, her voice saying thank you. Epilogue. To date, 300 miles of road have been obliterated in the South Fork of the Salmon River. 200 more are scheduled for obliteration. Though it is too soon to tell the effect these actions will have on the streams, tributaries, and fishes below, we can look to old data from the hundreds of miles of decommissioned roads on the Payette National Forest, the Nez Perce Clearwater National Forest, and others, and know that the work is not in vain. It's important to note, too, that healing the land, at least in the South Fork, was not unlike healing a body. Groups once at odds, both federal and local, tribal and non, came together to heal a landscape, remove a road, support a river, save her fishes. There are a lot of words for this kind of action, from collaboration to community. 
but whatever you call it, know that names are mutable as are definitions of words, like love, but maybe more like the definition of hope. We are, as humans, capable of a great many things. The wounds that men make in the earth do not quickly heal, writes Stegner. Still, they are only wounds. They are, at, are not absolutely mortal. Better a wounded wilderness than none at all. Lace your fingers together one more time for another look at the South Fork of the Salmon River. Perhaps you can see, in it, see it a little more clearly now, the drainages between your fingers, the steepness of the ridges. Imagine it as it can be in five years and 50 years and see the river as it flows between your fingers where the round of your knuckles meet, the river that has been carving the canyon of the South Fork of the Salmon River for millions of years. It's a story that begins in the rock and soil buried beneath muscle beds and rainstorms, cobbles and time. You can see it or start to if you roll your palms upward. Look at how they form something like a basin. Look at how they seem to be giving something away. Look at the life that runs in the lines. It's there. There's the answer, the one I told you was at the bottom of the river beneath a bridge that pauses like a comma. There is what it takes to make a new story. There is where the future of the South Fork, the salmon that is all fish, the West and the future for our predecessors live. There is the geography of hope, right there in your hands. Thank you. <laughs>